So welcome back to the channel and in today's video we are looking at why Ise Miyake is a master of fabric manipulation and I came across this documentary a while back where they were kind of talking about Ise Miyake's work um, so I thought it would be a good idea to react to the documentary. Now as always if you want to watch the full documentary I'll leave a link to that in the description below. Now I don't like to make too many assumptions when I make these videos so if you don't know who Issei Miyake is, um, he's a legendary Japanese designer. He's kind of considered one of the Japanese big three of designers so that's Issei Miyake, Yoji Yamamoto and Rei Kawakubo. Of course there are great Japanese designers that have come before them, whether we're talking about Kansai Yamamoto or Kenzo Takada, but they're known as the big three because they kind of all came up around the same time. And Issei Miyake's work is mainly known for his ability to manipulate fabrics, creating very interesting garments using very unique dyeing techniques, pleating techniques, and other things. So let's get straight into the video. From the maximum up to now, making clothes always started by choosing the fabric first and then designing it into something to be worn. With pleats, the process still of course starts with fabric, but just basic fabric. Then you make that into something that can be worn, and then you create the pleats. So the pleats come in last. The pleats are designed in a way that they bounce off your body, dance or highlight things. This was made possible by high technology. So what I wanted to express was something very human, natural. But then I wanted to progress much further and become more organic and irregular which means creating something unique, where no two are the same. And that's where twist came in. We have twist, pleats and twist, wrinkle and rumple. There's so many expressions of it. It can be dyed, heated, structured and cut. This will probably continue for some time and become a big theme towards the 21st century. So when I think of Issei Miyake, apart from of course the complexity of the designs, the first things I think about are comfortability and versatility. And I love how his whole career, he's kind of pushed the mould in fashion in terms of what's possible when it comes to fabrics. And I'm really a big fan of people that try to push fashion forward as a whole. And the most amazing thing about Issei Miyake's work is that even if you don't really care about the complexities of the fabric manipulation, if you're just looking at it as a product, as just like a garment to wear, they're actually very wearable, a lot of his clothes, um, which is actually really interesting that he's able to have such complex elements to the clothing, but to someone who doesn't really care about that stuff or doesn't know about that stuff, they can just look at the product that is the clothing and still like it. Now to quote something he said actually in a documentary, I wrote it down, he said, up till now making clothes always started by choosing the fabric first and then designing it into something to be worn. And I find that very interesting because most designers come up with a concept and draw their sketches and then they kind of just design. And then when it comes to actually making the garments, they just sort of add fabrics um, that they think will work. Um, but how Issei Miyake works, and he said this actually at some part in the documentary, he said that the reason he starts with fabric first is so that every time he designs, he designs to the specific properties and uses of the fabric. And that's why his clothing fits perfectly. Now, anyone who's watching this, if you're a designer, you know different fabrics have different weights. And what happens is those different fabrics sit differently on the body. 
So certain things might be best to design depending on the fabric. So the fact that Issey Miyake, at every essence of his design, he considers this is actually very, very interesting. He also briefly explained how the pleats are made, um, talking about how he designs the garment first then adds the pleats later. But I think what was more fascinating for me out of the things he said was how he said that when he creates the pleats, he creates very unique individualistic designs because the pleats bounce off your skin in certain ways and that's why they move so beautifully. So they're actually very individual to a person because how the pleats will bounce off someone's skin is very different depending on your body shape, your skin type, different things. So he's created a garment that can actually be very individual to the wearer, which is very, very cool. But I think in a general sense, there's this big focus on his pleats, whether that's pleats, please, um, please. Um, and I get it, that's what everyone knows. I'm even wearing that now. However, I feel like there are other fabric manipulation effects that he does use very commonly. Um, a good example is that kind of wrinkle and rumple effects that you see on a lot of his garments. And I think those are just as interesting and I think they just, they look as aesthetically pleasing as like the pleated um, garments, for example. Also, quick side note, I'm aware that this documentary was made around 1992 which I find very interesting because in this documentary he talks a lot about how he sees sort of the pleats being a big aspect of his work in the 21st century, which is interesting because he kind of predicted it because now the pleats are huge. Like obviously he just started developing it in the 80s and 90s and it wasn't until the 21st century that the pleats really took off and even now he has a whole like... He does runway shows that are just dedicated to the pleats. But that's just really fascinating, in my opinion. The man whose childhood ended the day the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, killing most of his family, and who has said, I had better forget, is an unashamed futurist. Clothes for him are not merely fashion to enhance modish physiques. They're philosophical statements, intellectual challenge, design as debate. This year, on an island off the coast of Osaka, the work of the fashion designer with a vision for the 21st century has been taken out of the shop window and placed in the context of a modernist gallery. In recognition of the view that says fashion and clothes design, when approached with Miyake's aesthetic rigor, can have the status of art. Ghostly figures clothed in gossamer light wisps of fabric have all the appearance of a sculptural installation. Unlike most designers, Miyake stands well apart from the vagaries of fashion trends. Questions of skirt length and shoulder width seem banal beside his quiet investigations. In his attempts to reconcile the ancestral and the futuristic, he experiments both with sophisticated synthetics as well as natural fibers with his longtime collaborator. He, he looks to the future, whether that's in terms of his design aesthetic or just in general, and that stems very much from the bad history that he's had being Japanese, of course, losing family members to the war and just the war-torn history of Japan. So he tends to not look to the past and he likes to look to the future, very interested in futurism and things like that. And I find that really, really authentic. And it makes a lot of sense why he likes to experiment with different synthetics or natural fibers and stuff uh, with the help of Makiko, who we'll get to later. Um, but yeah, that's what I wanted to say, but we can go back to the documentary now. Well, we humans live on this earth and, and benefit from the sun. The sun is bright as it shines, but it also creates shadows, bringing out these shadows in a beautiful way, whether it be by texture or by pleats. It's what I try to create. We can approach it in many ways and create different effects. The more you have a variety of textures, the closer you get to creating something that looks natural or closer to its natural form than with something that is just flat. I guess closer to earth in a sense. That's a fabric from wood pulp which looks like the bark of a tree. God created the body by calculations and made it look beautiful with movement. So the most important thing is to admire the human body and to admire humans. Then I think, what kind of fabric or material would look best on the body? 
I feel that designing is a positive action with a theme that says humans are wonderful. Now, for those who don't know who Makiko Minagawa is, um, I thought it would be good to pause it again here because she is really, really, really important when talking about the work of Issei Miyake. So Makiko went to Kyoto City University of Fine Arts where she studied textiles. So of course she's an expert when it comes to textiles and fabrics. And she has actually been, while well, she was, um, the head of textiles of the Issei Miyake brand from when it started to 2000 when she made her own brand under Issei Miyake Incorporated called Hat, which is quite similar to Issei Miyake's brand, which isn't far-fetched because like I'm gonna get to, she's the one who helped Issei Miyake bring all these amazing fabrics and all these fabric techniques to life. Um, so Hat is sort of kind of a brand that uses a lot of interesting, unique fabrics, a lot of fabric manipulation, which is her bread and butter. But to quote her directly, because she had a really good quote that she said about when she first met um, Issei Miyake. So she said, I met Issei Miyake by chance shortly after his return from New York when he was looking to show his collections in Paris with Japan as his base. And for that, some textile development was seriously needed. So I received the unexpected offer to work with him. Now, for guys who don't know, um, before Issei Miyake established his brand, he went to Paris and he went to New York to intern um, for many different brands. And that's why he has crazy, crazy design skills, apart from obviously what he learned in Japan. Um, so she literally met him when he was looking to set base in terms of creating his permanent brand. So like I said, Makiko is the key component. She's sort of like the glue of the brand. She brings everything together. Because this Miyake has said himself in many interviews, um, he says things like, he's the master of tailoring and he's the person who's a good designer, but he says himself that when it comes to textiles, he's not an expert in textiles, but he knows what he wants. He has ideas, but he doesn't have the knowledge to be able to bring these ideas of how he wants the fabrics to be or what type of fabrics to life. So that was why he brought Mikiko into the team. Mikiko would take those ideas and actually create these fabrics and bring them to life for Issei Miyake to use. So they were like the ultimate team, essentially. And I actually love that she's featured in this um, documentary, Makiko Minagawa, I mean, because normally there's this thing where designers get all the glory and I get it, like designers are the main names, um, people like to, I don't know, fantasize about designers, but designers don't do everything. It reminds me of like Balenciaga and what Demna Vesali is doing. Like people don't talk about Lotta Volkova who does all the amazing styling and helps with the imagery um, that like Demna is famous for or Martin Rose who's done consulting for a lot of the menswear shows. So I think a lot of the time designers get all the glory and then people I think start to genuinely think that like these designers do everything. Like I'm sure people think Issei Miyake is in labs as a textile expert making these fabrics, but he's not. He came up with the ideas, but he's not the one that actually created them. So I love when you have documentaries where they give props to different people in the team, especially people that are key elements um, into the success of a brand, essentially. A design dialogue between fabric and form found its natural expression in dance. You see, design which is worn by the human body moves, which creates something in itself. But our search is to actually make fabrics and shapes that transform, creating a beautiful world of movement. I guess Issy was told about me. Yeah, I, I mean, I knew uh, who Issy was long before that. But uh, he came then to a performance in Frankfurt one night and just showed up um, backstage. And we, <laughs> we talked and then uh, eventually he would come to Frankfurt every now and then and come with uh, all sorts of uh, clothes from his collections in garbage bags. And we'd go up to the hotel room and with some of the dancers and we would just try things on. Tons of costumes. Okay. okay. Miyake's method is never to sketch on paper, but to wrap. 
his starting point is always the human body. And he uses the couturier's skills he learned in the ateliers of Paris, of cut, stitch, and construction, to turn our assumptions of clothing on their head. Following their first meeting, Forsyth immediately asked Miyaki to create costumes for the dance. There was no script, no theme, and no brief. Instead, Miyaki observed the cast at work, was touched by the minutiae of their daily lives, and decided quite radically that what was needed was not costumes, but, as he put it, everyday clothes from his latest collection. And then, um... Of course, Issey Miyaki's idea of everyday clothes bears little relation to the size 10 to 16 creations of other fashion designers. He says if people understand his clothes, then he's failed, because they have not been challenged. These almost architectural forms here animated by dance are, he assures us, clothes to suit everyone. So Mikiko just said something very interesting that I wrote down. So she said, design that is worn by the human body moves, which creates something in itself. But our search is to actually make fabrics and shapes that transform creating a beautiful world of movement. And just based on this quote, because this is really how Makiko and Issey Miyake were thinking when they were creating clothes, and I think this deep consideration into how the clothing moves and fits on the body is why they're so comfortable, because it's so well considered. And normally when designers work with clients like dancers and things like that, they normally create specific costumes so that things can be more comfortable, it's less likely to rip and stuff, or say like a red carpet, they'll make like bespoke things for um, their clients. But what I find really interesting is Issey Miyake believes so much in like the comfortability and the movement of his garments that when he collaborated with these dancers based in Frankfurt, he was just like, no, I'll just use um, some clothing that I've already created for my line. I think that's really, really interesting. And it shows that he believes in his work. He believes in his designs. He believes, and it's almost, it's almost like garment testing, because if you really think your garments move the way they should and they're really comfortable enough for professional dancers to dance in them and not have comfortability issues or restriction issues, then that's just proof that Whatever you're designing and the reason why you're designing it, you essentially know what you're doing. All that's required is a leap of the imagination. I would have thought anyone could wear them, but not everyone would like wearing them. Until someone actually put a Miyake jacket on me, I had no idea how wonderful they were. I think he's got such an incredible feel for fabric in that he almost lets the fabric do what it wants to do so that when you put it on, you alter the way the fabric what the fabric's doing as you move, especially for trousers, it'll, it'll make a pattern, make an angle, and form its own sort of structure. And then when you move again, it'll alter. Or with this, what I'm wearing now, you can actually put this sort of on your head. Um, and it, you can almost cocoon yourself in it, or you can wear it over the back. So it depends a lot on how you're feeling. I tend to actually like it down, but if it's raining, then it obviously stops you getting wet. I think they're very practical. I mean, this isn't sort of, freshly ironed linen. It's meant to be sort of real looking. Um, once I've tried on and worn a pair of his trousers which had X number of percent bamboo fibre in them, which I think is just fantastic. I mean, that someone should be making clothes with bamboo in the fabric. Miyaki doesn't stop at bamboo. This is jute. This is mosquito netting with a pineapple fibre hat. Mud dyed cotton. Sun dried cotton. Rice bags. Cotton wrapped fishing line. Handmade Japanese paper and polyurethane. So, listening to the customer perspective of the potter is something I find really interesting because it's kind of common knowledge in fashion that well, not in fashion, but in the arts, that people that are artists or creatives that have jobs that can be physically demanding and they demand a lot of movement. So these are jobs like being a potter, pottery, or being a sculptor or being a painter, because there are some painters that 
paint on massive canvases and they have to do a lot of movement and stuff. So comfortability is really important. A lot of them, at least the rich ones, the ones that earn a lot of money, the type of painters that sell paintings for like tens of thousands of dollars or the type of potters that sell really expensive pottery or the type of sculptors that sell sculptures for loads of money, they wear brands like Ese Miyake and Yoji Yamamoto as sort of a uniform. Because of the comfortability, but also because they are creatives, they still appreciate something that is aesthetically unique and pleasing, even if it's going to be comfortable. And the perfect brands for that are Yoji Yamamoto and Ese Miyake. So it's sort of like known that they wear it as a uniform. And literally looking at her, she is, when I think of the stereotype of like the OG, really artsy um, customer for Issey Miyake, she is literally the stereotype I think of. So I just find it really fascinating. But I really liked her perspective on um, what she likes about it. Well, I've been involved in designing clothes for a long time now. And I can make calculations at a glance or in my head. You know, measurements, weight, and how something will look with the body inside it. I think we are craftsmen or artisans in the final analysis. No matter how advanced or modern our world is, as long as we do things we believe in profoundly from the bottom of our hearts, we can create wonders. It's fascinating. It's like the process of cooking a delicious meal. Well, Japan is such a small country. People live in limited space with not much room to put things away. So I wanted to come up with a fashion that was easy to take care of and one that didn't need a lot of space to store. So I find it completely insane that Issey Miyake just said that he has reached a level of fashion design mastery that he can make calculations just by looking at things and he can determine like weight changes or how something is going to fit on the body just at a glance, that is insane. Uh, he's reached that level of fashion design mastery. And I think what makes it even more impressive is that this was in 1992 when the documentary was made. Imagine now, which is now we're in 2021, this is almost like 30 years later. So he would be such a better designer even now which blows my mind, to be honest. That's just absolutely insane. And I think the Japanese big three, so to speak, whether we're talking Nyoji, Issei, and Rei, they are all from the same school of thought. They really, all three of them are people that really embarked on a journey to master their craft to the fullest, which I really, really respect. You, all you can do is respect it. Makiko also had a really interesting thing that she said. She was talking about how because Japan is like a small country with limited space, that her, her thinking was that she wanted to create garments and fabrics that don't take up too much space and can, they're like really compact and can be folded so they're easy to store and things like that. I find that really interesting and it makes a lot of sense. That's why a lot of Issei garments um, aren't super heavy and you can fold them and scrunch them and squeeze them and put them in really small spaces. Um, it's something I knew, but I didn't actually know that's something they considered in terms of the design process and the making of the fabrics. Um, so I find that even more interesting now that she said that. Miyaki's clothes, which are by no means cheap, can at least make claim to timelessness and practicality. Hence, the bag come jacket. I think it's very light and uh, it's very uh, comfortable and compact. You can go to the office and if when you have party at night, you can put it. You can roll it up, they just roll. When we got married in New York, my wedding outfit was Miyaki and this was the top. And um, we were upgraded, which is fantastic, on um, our flight. And the, the steward said, um, are you getting married? How wonderful. We know we'll upgrade you. And I said, could you look after this? He said, is it your wedding outfit? And I handed him this sort of tube, which, I mean, for him, was like, where's this huge white dress? It was extraordinary. This is the clothes what we need for now and 21st century, I believe. At the end, it was quite lovely to see Issey Miyake um, 
speaking English. That was that was really nice. And then also I love the story that the Potter gave about um, her wedding dress. That was quite funny. But yeah, I love this documentary mainly because when I think of Japit the three, the big three, so Rei Kaokubo, Yoji Yamamoto, Issei Miyake. I'd say out of all of those designers, I've definitely read about Rei Kaokubo the most. I've read a lot about Comme des Garçons. Um, Yoji, I've kind of read about him here and there in passing. I haven't really done a lot of research into the work of Issei Miyake, um, which is why this documentary was really amazing insight. And I did learn a lot. And then from um, watching this documentary, I went and did a bit more research into Issei Miyake's work. And the main reason um, why I haven't really done a lot of research on Issei Miyake is because um, in 2020, I embarked on a journey on becoming like really, really educated about fashion. So I had to start from like a certain time period and then I'm going up based on time period. So I can't just like read about Issei Miyake because I haven't even reached like the 20th century or the 21st century. Um, but I will get to it when I do. However, there's a YouTube channel called My Clothing Archive. Um, it's a new YouTube channel, but I know the guy who runs it, he's an archivist. So he has a deep collection of like Yoji, Calm, Issei. And I know that he's very knowledgeable about Issei Miyake because he gets a lot of like Japanese books and translates them into English so he can read them and stuff. So if there's someone way more knowledgeable than me about brands like Issei Miyake or Yoji Yamamoto, it would be this person. So I would suggest all of you subscribe to his YouTube channel. He has made one video right now, it's about Com, but I'm hoping in the future he'll make um, some videos about Issei Miyake, which I'll definitely be looking forward to watching. Um, so yeah, definitely check that channel out. But on that note, like this video, comment down below what you like about Issei Miyake's work. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you are new and of course a lot of work goes into my videos so if you want to support my channel um, you can support by subscribing to my patreon the link is in the description below it costs three dollars a month and for that basically you get access to extra content and um, i'm posting there quite frequently now um, but yeah on that note stay tuned for more videos